24 years ago, this man was convicted of a brutal murder in a small community. On leave from prison, he was welcomed in his hometown, the very place you'd expect him to be shunned. Many now doubt the guilt of Stephen Downing. Tonight, Midlands Report investigates why. Bakewell Cemetery in Derbyshire. On September the 12th, 1973, a woman was viciously attacked here. Two days later, she died. 25 years on, her murder is still talked about in the town. It was lunchtime on a crisp September day. A 17-year-old cemetery worker, Stephen Downing, was just finishing his morning's work. He lived near the graveyard and enjoyed the job. He was regarded by many as a quiet and slow lad. His shambling figure was well known in the small community. But he'd never spoken to the person who was about to change his life. Wendy Sewell, the woman he confessed to attacking, was walking in the Garden of Remembrance. Shortly after one o'clock, Stephen Downing stepped back into the chapel which the workmen used as a store. The jury believed that he then took a pickaxe handle, caught up with Wendy Sewell, and smashed the handle into her skull. Wendy Sewell had eight head wounds from a frenzied attack. She was stripped of her clothes and left to die on the path. Stephen Downing was questioned, he confessed, was charged, and then convicted of murder. It took the jury just one hour to reach a guilty verdict, but if it was so clear, why was the woman Downing murdered seen alive after it's claimed he attacked her? Why was another man seen running in panic from the cemetery? Why do experts argue Downing's confession is nonsense? And why are there gaps in the forensic evidence? Are these the ingredients for a dreadful miscarriage of justice? He was rather a shy, reserved lad. He didn't go out an awful lot. He'd got one or two friends just locally. I think, like any youngster, he used to look at the young lasses, you know, and think, oh, he's nice. But that's typical of a youth today, or even no, that no, time. Well, he had no girlfriends, had he? I mean, no, anything like that. No, no, but, but I suppose... He just spoke to everybody, uh, getting, you know, and, uh, well, another year might have been a different lad altogether. I mean, a silly thing. Right from me was a child, I used to buy fairy soap. And the block was too big, and I used to have to cut it in half. And it had the emblem of a baby on, and he used to cry. On the third day, they told us it was the summing up and everything. And I thought, well, this is it. The Stephen will be coming home with us. To be quite honest, I, I was full of confidence. There was nothing to convict him. Guilty. Do you have anything to say, Stephen? No. Since that moment in January 1974, Ray and Nita Downing have been struggling to clear their son's name. Their lives are on hold. For 23 years, it has been our life. Um, we were just sort of really enjoying ourselves, as it were. Stephen at 17 and Christine 14. We were just getting as a a family that we could get out and about and enjoy ourselves as such. We, we've had a, probably a good life as far as that goes, but obviously we have lost out on a lot. But certainly uh, Stephen has lost out the most. Have you been busy, Chris? Not the job I normally do, but ringing people up to see if they've had appointments. You have to put your life on hold because you live every day of that sentence with them. I got engaged at 16 and at the time I made him a promise that I wouldn't get married until he was at the wedding and that is something I will always stick by. If I was in a relationship I would probably live with somebody, I wouldn't get married, not until he could be at the wedding. 
Even before his trial, Stephen Downing had retracted his confession and made a new statement which his family believed to be the true order of events. It's also why he served seven years over his recommended sentence of 17 years, because he refuses to admit killing Wendy Sewell. Stephen had only been working for the council for three weeks. He'd lost previous jobs because of poor timekeeping, but somehow the gardening work in the cemetery seemed to suit him. So that lunchtime, while the court believed that Stephen took a pickaxe handle and attacked Wendy Sewell, he and his supporters say his actions were innocent. He stoked the fire lit on that frosty morning, then picked up nothing more than a pop bottle before making his way out of the cemetery. He was just normal. Well, he put his key in the door, so I think, and I said, I'm in love, but I thought it was Ray coming in. So he says, oh, you know, Mum, uh, I'm not supposed to be out, it's, it's my dinner break. I've been to the shop for some pop, it closed. Uh, can you call later and get me some? I said, yeah, certainly do. That particular weekend prior to this happening, he'd found baby hedgehogs and brought them in, care for them, feeding them with milk, with a, a little dropper thing. And it wasn't a very good one, it's one we'd had a while, so he asked me to call at the chemist and get him another. And that was his concern as well, that lunchtime, have he seen to the hedgehogs? So, I mean, it, Stephen wouldn't have that on his mind if he's supposed to have committed an attack. After that conversation with his mother, Stephen Downing went back to the graveyard where he found Wendy Sewell lying bleeding on a path. As he stopped, he knelt in her blood before running off to get help. His supporters argue it was this that led to his conviction. It's the viciousness of this attack. That wasn't Stephen at all. There was no viciousness in him. Um, yes, he was backward, there's no doubt about that. A slow learner. Psychiatric reports taken before his trial suggested Stephen Downing had an IQ of 90, with a reading age of 11. One found that it's highly unlikely that someone with his passive personality would impulsively attack a female, adding that he confessed after hours of questioning to escape the worst experience of harassment he'd had in his life. That confession, supported by forensic evidence, put Stephen Downing behind bars. Campaigners, like newspaper editor Don Hale, believe both elements are flawed. For three years, he's collected information on the Downing case and has now submitted it to the Criminal Cases Review Commission, the organisation which will soon decide if Stephen Downing should be granted an appeal. Stephen was basically convicted on a statement he'd made at the time. When you sit down and look through his statement, you look at what he's actually said, it could not have happened that way. Experts now confirm it couldn't have happened that way. Experts now confirm it did happen the way that he said later on. So was the confession valid? The police held and questioned the 17-year-old from two in the afternoon until he signed a statement admitting the attack at 10 past 11. At no point was a lawyer or his parents present. He should have had a solicitor or a care worker or something, but he wasn't able to look after himself. And he alleges that his hair was pulled, he was shaken twice to keep him awake. Um, the officers were even having, uh, allegedly having bets as to when he would confess. Now, this was all made uh, public in court. It was even said in the judge's summing up. Now, surely this is wrong, no matter who the guy is. But when he is described as back, when it's accepted he's, he's a low IQ, surely um, the authorities should be giving him some assistance in actually uh, helping with the interrogation rather than uh, criticising him and keeping him in the situation. John Plimmer has recently retired from the West Midlands Force as a detective superintendent. He led many murder investigations and is an expert in interview techniques and police practice. 25 years ago, there was very little difference to how we work today. You get a juvenile or any vulnerable person who's been interviewed without a parent, guardian or other independent person to protect them. That, as far as I'm concerned, is a nonsense. Apart from being a juvenile, this person had learning difficulties. This lad should have been examined psychologically or at least uh, by a police surgeon to see if he was fit for interview before being interviewed. And the third case is, is the duration in which he was interviewed. I believe it was something between five and seven hours. 
um, that is incredible without a break. From my view today, it would be inadmissible. During the questioning, Ray Downing visited the police station several times. He was told Stephen didn't need a solicitor, was given his son's personal effects to take home and asked to bring a complete change of clothes. There was very little we could do to help Stephen because they just wouldn't allow us to. They just uh, kept putting us off and, uh, as I say, uh, saying he, he, he was just being questioned, he wasn't uh, charged or anything like that, no arrest. And we believe them. At the trial, the judge cautioned the jury about Downing's confession. The Honourable Mr Justice Neal told the jurors that Downing's evidence of being shaken to stay awake, of being hungry and of officers betting on him confessing could be bordering on oppression, although Stephen's own barrister said there was no impropriety on the part of the police. But these doubts about the confession are not the only problems. The way forensic evidence was gathered and interpreted has also been called into question. Stephen Downing's clothes were stained with Wendy's blood, either from an attack or from helping her. But there's no other physical evidence to link him to the assault. If he'd been wearing gloves, as the police say, they might be smeared with blood. Instead, there are just minute spots. Yet had he attacked her with no gloves on, the murder weapon should carry his bloody fingerprints. It doesn't. And there was no forensic evidence of the sexual assault he mentioned in his confession. Group Captain Geoffrey Oxley learned the skills of analysing photographs during a career as a military intelligence officer. He now runs an agency specialising in forensic examination of film and photographs. My overall impression of how this photography in this case was gathered by the police is that it was done very poorly. They hadn't covered areas at a sufficient number of angles to be able to get uh, really in-depth pictures of the scene. But importantly, they hadn't used colour. And if you're looking at a murder scene where blood stains become very important, you must have colour photography to be able to differentiate subsequently blood from, shall we say, oil stains. These flaws are now seen as crucial because the photographs were the prosecution's main source of information about the scene of crime. On top of that, the scene was never cordoned off and some evidence apparently ignored altogether. Wendy Saul was attacked in one place but found in another. How did she get there and why was her route never photographed? This is the spot where Stephen Downing found Wendy Sewell when he came back from his lunch. And actually on this tombstone, forensic found spots of blood. Well, what is not explained is that Stephen went to find assistance straight away and within a minute or so of coming back, the body had moved from here to a spot about 30 yards away. She would have come across here, very, very difficult to negotiate, in a semi-conscious state. How could anyone have got from A to B without leaving a trail of blood? This is what the forensic failed to establish as to how he managed to get from uh, one point to another. There are many aspects of the original photography that don't tie up with the confession. Um, in particular, um, how the body was moved and, and things of that sort. It just doesn't seem to tie up unless the police did a thoroughly bad job and never in fact looked for the trail of blood in the first place. The reason why Downing's campaign focuses so much on the value of the photographs is because the government's forensic scientist was not called to the scene of crime. Working from the pictures and Stephen's clothing, Norman Lee said the markings were a textbook example of the pattern of blood staining which might be expected on the clothing of Wendy's assailant. He reached an unambiguous conclusion that Stephen was guilty from a set of photographs today deemed poor and unprofessional. Russell Stockdale runs his own forensic laboratory. Before that, he was principal scientist for the Home Office Forensic Science Service. A year ago, he reviewed this case. Well, this on the uh, bench is uh, Downing's clothing, which Norman Lee examined in 1975, and which I examined uh, rather more recently than that. Um, this is the T-shirt, and as you can see on the back of the T-shirt, uh, Mr. Lee has marked in crayon uh, two blood stains. That was the extent of the blood staining on, on the T-shirt. Moving on to the jeans, um, the blood on the jeans is extremely difficult to see. Um, the, the, the visibility of the blood has deteriorated significantly in 25 years, and the jeans are also 
uh, very grubby in their own right. You can see obvious blood staining in the knee area. The prosecution said these stains came from a frenzied attack on Wendy Sewell. The defence said it was from Stephen helping her. This scientist believes that even at the time, no one could be sure. There must have been doubt in the absence of detailed information about the nature and distribution of blood staining at the scene, because as it, it appears at least, all that was available was Norman Lee's evidence on his observations about the clothing. And to my mind, that's not good enough. This is the murder weapon, uh, the pickaxe handle. And we can see uh, quite a lot of staining around the, the pick end. And that is probably blood, although the, um, to be precise about what was and what wasn't blood would have to be ascertained by chemical testing. It is possible for an assailant to uh, launch an attack on the victim, to cause heavy bleeding, to cause a great deal of blood splashing uh, at the scene, but then to walk away with virtually no blood on him. But of course, in this case, we don't know the extent of the blood staining at the scene. We don't know its nature and its distribution. So we don't know what to expect on the clothing of the assailant. The murder and Stephen Downing's imprisonment have always been a matter of debate in Bakewell. Ray Downing runs one of two local taxis. In a small community, he can't avoid meeting Wendy Saul's mother. On the night uh, that Stephen was taken to the police station, we did meet Wendy's mother. And she spoke to us. And she still does speak to me anyway. I, um, I don't know that she knows me too well or what, but no, I we didn't do speak. Know the lady at all. And I've always remembered what she said. Whatever happens, it was between our children and not us. And I respect her for that. The night that Stephen was taken to the police station, Anita says, come on, we're walking down the road. We can hold our heads up. We did then, and we still do believe him innocent. Well, we said and, uh, we accept people take us as I we mean, are. Uh, they have their own opinion. And the, I mean, people are entitled to their own opinion. Of course they are. And uh, we thought, right, we've got to face the public and just see what response we get. Well, As it happens, we've, we've had a good response. We've made friends. People have remained genuine friends. And it's things like this that help you through a trauma. Come on, ladies, don't miss these bargains. It's the end of the day. We've got to clear. I used to go we've to streets. I mean, I used to go to Ramage's fruit up. stall. Um, and just generally chit-chat. They said, you know, is your son allowed to have anything? And I said, yes, while he's on remand, he can have various items. So they said, well, we'd like to donate fruit and stuff. And he used to keep his mates going. The church, they had a collection, apparently. The vicar came up, bouquet of flowers for me, chocolates, money from the parishioners. You know, this is the sort of support. This is even in the early days before people learned what they're learning now. And the support continues. Two years ago, three and a half thousand townspeople signed a petition to Parliament calling for Stephen to be released. On a home visit four years ago, the prison officer with Downing found many people eager to greet his prisoner. He wrote, It came across very strange to me how in a small community where I assume a murder only takes place once in a hundred years, when the offender returns home, he's welcomed by a great deal of local people. Maybe there's something in the point he's trying to make about not being guilty. And over the years, more information has come out. New witnesses, or in some cases, old witnesses, changing what they have to say. One helped the police establish the time of the attack. George Pearson told the court that he'd seen Wendy near the cemetery gates. But now he's changed that story. In fact, he was halfway down the steep path known as the Butts, when he greeted Wendy Sewell. You right? That's about four minutes' walk from the cemetery, and it significantly reduces the time Stephen Downing would have had to carry out any attack. Wendy was next seen at the top of the butts inside the cemetery. Charlie Carman was heading back to work in Bakewell when he spotted her, and on his way down the butts, he passed George Pearson walking up the hill. Some minutes later, Downing himself reported seeing Wendy at the other end of the graveyard in the Garden of Remembrance. And then comes a vital witness, Jane Atkins. She was too afraid to appear, but her mother agreed to talk. 
This is number 20, where my family and I lived from 1970 to 77. Just over my shoulder, you can see the chapel and the cemetery where it all happened. The evidence from Jane Atkins formed the basis of an early appeal for Stephen Downing, but it was thrown out because the prosecution argued it might not have been the day in question. The teenager didn't come forward until reading about the trial at the time. Once Stephen was convicted, Jane described what she saw that lunchtime. She'd gone into the cemetery looking for their lost dog and crucially spotted Wendy Sewell alive and well after Downing was supposed to have attacked her. It was around this area that Jane caught the dog. She seen Stephen leaving through the main gate, which is down there. And also she seen Wendy Sewell with a gentleman in this area. Mrs Beebe is confident that this was after the police said the attack had happened. It was definitely lunchtime because it's bedlam in our house at lunchtime and it was definitely between ten past one and half past one. And also Jane was definitely in school uniform because it was definitely a school day. So back in 1974, the court had the information it needed to place Jane Atkins at the cemetery on the Wednesday of the murder. It was her first day in school uniform. On the Monday and the Tuesday, Downing was off sick, so not in the cemetery. And for the rest of the week, he was in prison. Even in 1974, it should have been clear that Jane was talking about the day Wendy was attacked. The court then recorded three witnesses, Mr and Mrs Walker, who lived in the cemetery gatehouse, and Peter Moran, all seeing Stephen leaving the graveyard at about the same time as Jane Atkins. All agreed he appeared calm and normal. By complete contrast, other witnesses saw a running man that same lunchtime. Mary Hadfield gave evidence to the court. Well, about three years ago, I interviewed a, a crucial witness, Mrs Hadfield. She lived uh, very close to the cemetery, and she gave evidence of seeing a, a man running like a bat out of hell at the time. This is the tape that I took from her. Unfortunately, she's no longer with us. With this man that you, you, you saw uh, coming past you... Running? Running past you, you said... Uh, like he was going like a bat out of hell at one time. When he, he was going the there? other way, when yes. he was running away, yes. 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 And which direction was he heading towards? Up the road. Towards Lady Manor? Yes, towards the crossroads. Towards the crossroads, yes. right. Now, she saw blood staining on this man as well, and she makes notes of it on here. You said with this that uh, you, you thought he had some like, blood staining yes. on him. Yes, I told you about it. Yes. That. This was on mainly on one leg, on, on that, the, the left, left leg. leg. Yes, left jeans. And a horseshoe mark or something. On the bottom of the bottom. Bottom. Shortly after the trial, Mrs. Hadfield put a name to the running figure. Although she told the police, the person was never interviewed. Also available at the time was the testimony of George Paling. He was out with his grandchild when he saw a running man who stopped, caught his breath, then headed off across the playing fields of Lady Manor's school. Of all this evidence, only the statement of Jane Atkins was not available at the trial. But only five years later, the police learned something which could have transformed Stephen Downing's case for an appeal. Wendy Sewell's boyfriend at the time of the murder had said he was not in Bakewell, but at a sheep sale in Wales. But Don Hale learned that in 1979, the police knew that his alibi was suspect. A former detective constable has now given evidence to the Criminal Cases Review Commission. He wanted to investigate this uh, matter further. He did interview the person concerned. Um, and challenged him on this matter. But he was prevented from further investigating this by senior officers. This is 20 years ago. Now, the file on all this has been gathering dust for all that time. We didn't know about it. Nobody knew about this, in, this uh, new evidence that came forward until this officer came forward last year. He said that it had it preyed on his conscience for this time. He'd recently retired and felt that after reading um, the progress of... Stephen Downing's latest evidence and, and potential appeal, that something should now be done about it. And he came forward, he's now given evidence which could well be crucial to the investigation. The impact of that evidence should be known by the end of the month. The Criminal Cases Review Commission is considering a mass of information provided on Stephen Downing's behalf. 
so in a matter of weeks, he could know if he's to be freed. Two men have come on the phone and warned me off getting involved with the investigation for this, that just to leave it alone. Uh, one guy said that if I didn't leave it alone, I would be blown away. Um, and I tend to think, well, perhaps I'm getting on the right tracks here. He's been in now nearly 25 years, and nearly every year, uh, somebody's gone to him from the pro board or somebody else to say, look, admit you've committed this crime and we'll let you go. He's not prepared to do that. And he's told me, he's told his family, he's prepared to spend the rest of his days in prison, if need be, until he proves his innocence. I believe Stephen Downing is innocent and I believe there's evidence now to confirm and support his claims. The last chance Stephen had to relax with his family was on holiday, two weeks before he was arrested for the murder. Then he was a child. Now he's a man. His parents are trying to control their optimism. In a campaign lasting a quarter of a century, they've had their hopes dashed many times before. Well, it's been a dream, you know, really waiting for that day, for, you know, to be told, well, right, you have been found not guilty, or we hope he will be found not guilty. I would feel the cloud has been lifted. Um, and knowing Stephen, as when he came home for those two days, the first thing he did was walk in, have a look round, sit in his usual chair. This is my place, he said. And next uh, thing, Nita was washing some uh, pots and he was straight in the kitchen to dry, as though he'd never been away. So it would be just fantastic. He would be back to what he was doing. Um, and of course, as I say, it would take the weight off us by oh, tons and tons of golfers. You feel excited, you feel frightened. There's so many things that would be different if he was home. We've got to learn to be a family again. So, to a degree, it's, it's a little bit frightening because you think you know a person, but you only know part of them because you only see them once every two or three weeks. So, there's a lot of different emotions that you feel that how I'd really feel when he actually got released, I honestly don't know. We've had highs and we've had lows. I've learned myself to suppress it a bit, but I don't know, I think I should just want to hug him to death. So. <laughs>